the theology of Christ and what he has done and what he's going to do. And so Paul is probably using a very familiar song in the life of the church to remind the people of God to live for Christ. And he actually makes this point. He says, hey, the purpose of my letter is so that you'll know how to behave in the church. He's been talking about a number of things, especially in chapter 2 and chapter 3. In chapter 3, we see the qualifications for elders, overseers, as well as deacons. But chapter 2 is packed with stuff, instruction as well. And then he goes on in chapter 4 through 6, more instructions. And Paul says, the point of my letter, verse 15, is so that you'll know how to behave in the household of God. And it's meant to focus their attention, not so much on the behavior, all the thou shalt, but on the person of Jesus Christ and his work. Isn't that interesting? That when he says the purpose of my letter, I'm just packed with instructions on to do and not to do, that he focuses them in on Jesus and says my point is behavior and has for God. Now look at Jesus. Look at the mystery of Godliness. You should be looking at godly life. The church should be filled with godly believers. Oh, and by the way, look at the model for that, which is what we'll look at here in a moment. So it's a song meant to focus their attention on Jesus. A song meant to instruct and produce spiritual growth in the lives of Christians. So today we're going to quickly look at six benefits. Whenever you got six points, you can only spend just a little you know, moment. It's kind of like a rock skipping across the water. you got to get from point to point. Otherwise, you know, you'd be here until, uh, I don't know, uh, everybody else gets done with the bar. The, uh, 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 so six quick benefits Jesus brings to you and me. So write this down. If you're taking notes, the first one is this. Jesus is the model of godly behavior. Jesus is the model of godly behavior set for you and for me. So if you look back at verse 16, he says, great indeed, we confess is the mystery of godliness. And Paul's, this is Paul's way of saying that the behavior of the Christian is to flow out of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion, listen, religion tells us get better. Essentially, there's two religions in the world. Very simplistic. But you can go out and study all these various religions in the world. And I don't care which one you study. And you compare it to biblical, authentic Christianity. And it's two different essential messages. Okay? The one message, which is broad and appears in so many different world religions, is this idea of work harder, get better, in order to please, you know, whatever conception of God that you have, or no God. The point is to, to, to enhance your life, to better your eternity, to, to get a better reincarnation, to be absorbed in the wrong of the sky, whatever the iteration of religion it is around the world, this idea of get better, do better, work harder, reach up, and the other religion is not reach down and did everything necessary to make you right with God, so you trust me. It's Jesus. One religion says work hard. The other religion says everything that you need to work to do, and Jesus did it. That's why when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. <laughs> the work that God said, my Father sent me to do, it's done. Redemption is accomplished. Now, do we work as believers? Yes, but it's not in order to please God so that we're brought into the family. And, and so that we're, we're kept in the family, it's because we are already in. And we're in the household of faith, and so we want to act like his kids. We want to honor our heavenly day because we're part of the family. So it's a different motivation. And Paul doesn't come back to them and say, do this, don't do that, all these you know, rules and regulations, and devoid and focus on Christ. He makes sure that the central focus, the motivation, the model of Christian behavior in the household of God is centered on the person of Jesus, the mystery of godliness, he calls it. I want you to know how you can behave in the household of God, he says in verse 14 and 15. So Paul's been writing about house rules. Now, I, I, I'm sure in your household, uh, you have some house rules. 
Some are spoken, some are unspoken. You kind of have rules between you and your spouse when you're married, certainly with your kids. They have expectations of behavior. Don't go back past this and what you do. Uh, you don't live up to this. Household expectations and rules. And so Paul uses that idea and says, hey, this is a household of God, a living church. This is, this is God's household purchased by the blood of Christ. And there are certain household expectations, but it's all rooted in the model of our Christian behavior, who is Jesus. Look to Jesus. And he says in verse 16, great indeed, megas. Uh, you can hear mega in there, big, large, huge, right? And great indeed, uh, one writer puts it, to be esteemed highly for its importance. In other words, the gospel is the most important thing for Christians. It's the most important thing for Christians, what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he has done. Great indeed, he says. Since the time of Christ, the church has needed to return to the main thing, which is the person and work of Jesus. It always just comes back to that simple message and the person of Christ. Now, in Ephesus was one of the wonders of the ancient world. Anybody know what it was? Temple of Diana or Artemis, right? And in Acts 19, 28, boy, they were all ticked off at the apostles and thought there was a threat to their Artemis worship. And so everybody in the community all gathered together. They're just filled with rage and an uproar. They start screaming, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And they just keep yelling and you just hear just pounding like you're in a stadium rock concert. I mean, just... Or to Trump rally. And it's just like loud screaming, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They were just filled with rage. And what is the threat? And Paul writes to Christians in Ephesus and says, No, no, no. no. Great is the mystery of godliness. Who? He goes and lists all. And it's obvious who he's talking about. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Artemis isn't great. This false deity is great. Jesus, the one who came from heaven, he is great. So easy for us to get distracted by budget planning as a church, executing activities, enjoying Bible studies, all good things, great times of fellowship, gathering for corporate worship, and all the things that we do in church life. It's, it's, those are all good things. But do you know it's possible to do all? good things and lose sight of the main thing, which is Christ and Him crucified, the gospel of Jesus, the person in His work. It is easy to get distracted. And so Paul wants to make sure that when he's talking about what to do and what not to do and how to, how to behave in the household of God, that he says, focus in on Jesus. He's the model of your Christian behavior. He says in verse 16 as well, he's the mystery. Well, he says we confess. We confess. You see that great indeed? We confess. And literally, as one person put it, without controversy, this is understood to be true. It's a consensus among us as Christians. This is a common confession that we have. This mystery of godliness. Do you see that? The mystery of godliness. Now, what is what is this mystery of godliness? You had first century mystery religions. Okay? All these pagan deities. And Paul says, well, great indeed is the mystery of godliness. Who? And he goes and talks about Christ. But why does he say the mystery of godliness talking about Jesus? Well, the mystery of godliness is rooted in... In, in, in the Old Testament narrative, as you read through the Old Testament, and you see throughout Old Testament history, saints coming into view and then going out of view, and you have the cycle of people throughout all the Old Testament, but they were all sinners. Some were better than others, some messed it up pretty badly, but they were all equally sinners. And so when you end up reading through the Old Testament, you end up going, I feel a little let down. Because there's no one that rises to the surface that is actually perfect, that, that doesn't sin, that doesn't do something foolish at some point. 
And it increasingly becomes clear as you read through the Old Testament and move toward the end that we need a perfect person. We need somebody else to enter into human history that can represent us before God and connect us with God. Do whatever is necessary to connect us in with God. And in the New Testament, this mysterious person is revealed. And his name is Jesus. Okay? So it's concealed in the Old Testament. And it's revealed in the New Testament. The need is in the Old Testament. The answer is in the New Testament. His name is Jesus. So Paul's, to Paul's point here, we've got to be intentional about grounding our Christian behavior in the example of Jesus. Now listen, you might look at some other people in your life, maybe in your past, as you remember, maybe you look around and you think, man, that person's the same, that person, I want to be like that person. Maybe it's a grandmother, your mother, father, grandfather, somebody in the church that you've watched and you're like, man, if I could just be like that. Listen, all your heroes have feet of clay. And every one of them have needed the grace of God and salvation. Every one of them has have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And they needed redemption. They needed to be rescued out of darkness and brought into faith in Christ. Okay? There's only one person that we can look to as the ultimate model for Christian behavior. And who is it? Jesus. He's the only perfect example how we're supposed to look and live. So we model our behavior and godliness after Christ. And so I want you to think about this with me. As you meditate on Christ, and you think about what he did in his life, you think about his ministry, you think about the love that he showed when he taught, you, you, you read about his promises, you meditate on his promises, and it's really odd. As you spend time with Christ and you read about Jesus and you meditate on the cross, you, you become increasingly more like Jesus. It's weird. As you keep looking at the face of Christ, you begin to reflect his glory more. I mean, it's, it, you know, it, it happens when we have other idols and other things that we are really focused on. Whatever we're really hard focused on, that's what we tend to become like. We become like our gods. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Do you see that? He's saying you look at the face of Christ and the more you gaze at the glory of God in the face of Christ, the more you begin to reflect that glory, the more you begin to be transformed into his likeness. And so Paul is rooting Christian behavior in the model of Jesus Christ. So keep looking at Jesus. You know, I grew up in, grew up in church life and uh, pretty legalistic. And I heard a lot of do and don't and God's going to get you and all that kind of stuff. And it was so frustrating. It was so frustrating. I don't need religion. I'd like to find religion and kick it in the teeth. I can't stand religion. What I came to discover is it's about Jesus. Yeah. It's about a relationship with God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has done everything necessary to make God happy with me. And all I need to do is trust in Jesus and keep looking at the face of Christ. His word. And I begin to please God in my character. Who I am. So we're looking at six benefits when uh, Jesus brings to you and me. Jesus, we see we saw it, is the model of godly behavior. Secondly, we see that Jesus, right now, Jesus is God in flesh. <clears throat> Who came close to you and me? Look back at verse 16. Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. He, or who, was manifested in the flesh. Manifested in the flesh. So the mystery of godliness is actually the person. And it's this person who is God, became, who became flesh, Jesus. Since he was manifested, that word simply means revealed and put on display. So the mystery of godliness, who is a person, was revealed and put on display. 
explain. His name is Jesus. He came in the flesh, came down from heaven, second person of the triune God, who took on full divinity, while, uh, true humanity, while he retained uh, full divinity. So he's the God-man. John 1, 14 and 18, which we have heard at least one of those this morning, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory, glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then verse 18 of John 1 was really interesting. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. A very powerful statement on the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, who obviously they're writing about the God-man. They knew Him. And they're writing about this man who is also God, and they call him God, who is at the right hand of the Father. So they actually attribute divinity to Christ and call him the God who is at the right hand of the Father, Jesus. So you think about how Jesus became God in the flesh and came close to us, uh, coming down from heaven as a seed planted in a young virgin girl who became pregnant and she gave birth to Jesus, the God-man, fully God, fully human. Think about how he was manifested in the flesh when he grew up in this uh, poor, uh, just common laborer's home. His adopted dad, Joseph, and his biological mother, Mary, essentially adopted dad. And so he grows up in the context of a poor peasant family, an older man, and a young girl, Mary. And Jesus grows up not in, not in one of these met metropolitan areas of Rome where he could have some great influence, right? He didn't study how to, how to win friends and influence people. Just to quote a name of a book that's been popular in times past, okay? No, he, he grew up in a backwater town named Nazareth, which was a no-name no nothing that had zero respect with people outside that community. It was a small town, nothing, out of which nothing ever came. There was the youth This is Jesus being revealed, God made flesh, being revealed to humanity, growing up in that kind of a town. He walks the land, he goes into villages, towns, and cities, he travels to the busy portside areas of Galilee, he sees fishermen, he, he, he meets other people, and he calls men to leave their family businesses and careers, and he doesn't ask them, he just says, come follow me, and they do. This is Jesus being revealed to humanity. He calls a political rat. As well as a political traitor to be part of his company, his band of 12. People from opposite poles of political spectrum in first century Judaism. Come be part of the tribe, boys. And they do. And then, when the one who was considered a traitor to his own people, the Jewish people, when he excitedly invited over the other traitors, people that, you know, the good Jewish people hated, he invited them over to his house. His other tax collectors and sinners, and he had a big dinner for them because he had been called by the master to come follow him. And so he's excited. He brings all these other sinners, all these other outcasts over to his house. He's unclean, dirty people. In the eyes of the Jewish people, <coughs> Jesus goes and he eats with them. This is, this is how God chooses to reveal himself, manifest himself in the flesh. He manifests himself in the flesh as one who comes down really low and then comes close to us right where we're at. Jesus didn't tell Matthew, hey, you tell all your dirty little stinking tax collector buddies they fix their lives and then I'll show up and eat dinner with them. He didn't do that. He just showed up. And he came close to them. And he sat down, and you know what the religious people did? Well, they got their shorts on the wall. That's what they did. <laughs> they got all ticked off. They got mad at Jesus. Because imagine that, the second person to try you, God, God in the flesh. What is that holy enough for? Imagine that. And when he was baptized, he identified the lowly 
were sinners. And when he was crucified, he bore the guilt and the shame of sinners like you and me standing there crucified naked and ripped to shreds because of your sin and mine. He came close. Holy One from heaven condescended Lord himself to come close so that he can bring us to God. He entered into relationship with people. Listen, he still offers that blessing of relationship with God today if you will trust in him alone. Trust in Jesus alone to save you. And you can be forgiven of your sin. He came close to the untouchables of his day, the lepers, the prostitutes, the sinners, the unclean, and he'll come close to you too. And I am so grateful for that. Because I'm not going to lay out my past life in front of you and look at it, pick me apart. And here's the beautiful thing God knows everything about me, he knows everything I've ever done. And he loves me. And he chooses to not bring up my sin as an accusation in the throne room of grace ever. Because it's already been cast on Jesus who took my guilt and shame. So I want you to think about this. Jesus manifested in the flesh, came close to us. And since the church is his family, since the church is his body, the family of God, the household of God, we should be present among his people. And we should seek to be like Jesus and model of our, model of our behavior. And, and we should seek to engage others relationally. He came close to us so that we in turn can get close to others who are in the family of God as well as outside the family of God who don't know Jesus yet. Listen, you're not unholy by creating a relationship with somebody who is outside of faith. Okay? You're not unholy for creating a friendship with somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Just make sure you got some deeper friends and friendships that are holding you accountable in the family of God. The church is the environment of grace that allows us to open up with each other and come close to each other, to love each other the way that Jesus loves us. That's, that's one of the beauties of smaller groups, like Sunday school classes, or in home small groups, be part of one of those. And then as we, as, we, as we learn to love each other the way Christ loves us, then other people will know we're his disciples, and people out in the world will go, I want to thank God. That's a loving place. I want that. They like to come close to people. You know, in many churches today around the United States have a reputation for being against all the evil. We've got to stand for truth. We've got to stand against evil. But you know what? People who are wrapped up in their sin ought to walk away from a conversation with you going, you know, I disagree with that guy, that girl, but I know that Isn't that what Jesus did? Sinners would walk away from Jesus sometimes and, and, and maybe not believe, but they knew that he loved them. So we're looking at six benefits today that Jesus brings to you and me. He's the model of God and behavior sent to you and me. He's God of the flesh who came close. Write this down. Jesus is the perfectly righteous one mediating for you and me. He's the perfectly righteous one mediating for you and me. Look at the next line there. Vindicated, who was vindicated by the Spirit. Jesus was declared righteous, justified by the Spirit of God. It might sound to you, odd to you or more deeply into theology to say that Jesus was declared righteous or justified by the Holy Spirit of God. But that is essentially what's being said in this one statement. He was vindicated by the Spirit. The actual word that's used uh, and translated vindicated or justified, your translation may say, is the same that is so often translated as righteous or righteousness. And the world, you got to remember, the world called Jesus a fraud. He called, they called Jesus a liar, a deceiver. But the Holy Spirit proved that Jesus is true. Righteous in his claims to be from God, the Savior of the world, which is Paul's point here when he says vindicated by the Spirit. So the Spirit of God showed up on a daily basis for Jesus. He empowered Christ for ministry. Jesus relied on the Holy Spirit for empowerment. 
But there are also special occasions where the affirmation of the Holy Spirit of God would be poured out upon Christ in his favor. Like in Matthew 3, at the baptism of Jesus, when Jesus was baptized immediately when he went up out of the water. And behold, the heavens were open to him, Matthew says. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming and resting on him. And behold, a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And so there was a special... There was a special vindication in that moment that, hey, this Jesus who is claiming to be from God, the Messiah, the second person of the triune Godhead, this Jesus, he's telling the truth. We see that at the baptism. We see that. We see that in a number of occasions, such as the transfiguration. When God shows up again, the triune God is there, God the Father, Son, and Spirit, all present. But the greatest vindication of Jesus, listen, was when God's Spirit entered into the tomb that third uh, morning, and that Sunday morning after Jesus had died, when the Spirit of God opened up at the life gate for Christ to, to come out of that tomb and resurrect from the dead. That was the greatest declaration of the righteousness, the truthfulness of of all that Jesus had said and done. Uh, Paul write, writes in Romans 1, 4, makes this clear. Christ Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that was a vind the greatest vindication of all. <clears throat> the greatest, hey, he's righteous, he's telling the truth, was when he, you know, anybody can die. You can even die in the cross. But when you come back up out of the tomb, that's a different story, okay? And that's his point. So he's the perfect, Jesus is the perfectly righteous one who's given us his righteousness. He sits at the Father's right hand representing us, mediating on our behalf. Listen, you don't, listen, I don't mean this to, to be funny, okay? I don't. I'm not trying to slam anybody here. But I want you to think about this. The Bible tells us there is one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. You don't have to pray to Mary. Mary does not have a special meal to Jesus. You don't have to pray and think about the treasury of merit for the saints in heaven. You're not going to tap into anybody's uh, you know, uh, saint in life and get, get them to go talk to Jesus and pray for you. You don't need any other mediator. You can go right to Jesus because Jesus himself, according to Hebrews, is our mediator. You go straight to Christ because he's at the Father's right hand, mediating for us, interceding for us. So when the devil accuses us before God, and he does, Jesus mediates for us and tells the Father that our sins are removed, his righteousness applied, and therefore we are clean. Some of you may have a dark sense of foreboding guilt. Something from your past just keeps hanging on. And you may have asked God to forgive you. You may have, you may have asked him a thousand times or more, please forgive me of that. And that, that conscience of yours is so weighted down. It's like, it's like a fish hook that gets into a deep, deep sea creature and it just kind of stays right in the lip, right? And I was watching a show the other day that happened. I'm a big old shark, right? He's got a fish hook in there. And, and, and Satan does that. He'll, he'll hook us with guilt. But that's a healthy guilt that we've got to confess sin. And we're holding on to stuff. We've got to repent, turn from it. But then there is this type of guilt that is from the devil who likes to accuse us and remind us of all that we've done. Especially that real treat that we did that one time. And he wants to remind us, and he's got that barb in our souls. And even though we go to Christ and we say, forgive us, forgive me, I've done wrong. God, you know what I did. And we just keep going back to that thing. You know what? I'll tell you what, please God better. Then you asking God for forgiveness for the millionth time for that same sin. I'll tell you what, I'll honor God better is just simply to trust him. And what he did through Christ. Next time you're tempted to ask God to forgive you for that same sin that you've confessed a thousand times, instead stop, pause, and begin to turn it into a thanks. Thank you, O oh Christ, for paying for that sin on the cross. 
Thank you for dealing with that sin completely. Thank you, Father, that you will never bring that up to accuse me ever again. I praise you, Lord Christ. Because I'll tell you what, what the devil's trying to do is to get you to think about anything other than Jesus. Turn it on his head and begin to use that trigger of guilt and all that as a trigger to praise the Lord Jesus Christ and thank the Lord Jesus Christ from the heart in worship. And now you're doing the exact opposite that the devil wants you to do, and you will have victory. And I want you to rest in the righteousness of Christ. Come to him just as you are, and let him make you just as Christ is. Let him do the work of cleaning you up. Write this down in our next one very quickly. Jesus is the delight of angels. Lent to you and me. Back in verse 16 again, it just simply says, who was seen by angels. Very short little statement there. You think about what God has done. He shared his son with sinners. He lent his beloved one to you and me. Jesus, the one who possessed divine glory in heaven. And Jesus, the delight of heaven, and God sends the delight of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, to take on human flesh. And so is it any wonder that the angels of heaven quickly ran to Christ at different times in his ministry? And they wanted to serve the Son of Man on earth. They delighted in serving the one they loved. And we, we see the angels of God were present in creation and they sang and rejoiced when, create, uh, when God created everything through Christ. They were there singing and praising the angels served in heaven and did the will of God as messengers, as servants throughout history. And when you read through the Old Testament and you read um, what, what appears to be uh, someone sent from heaven, a messenger of God, often it says it's the angel of the Lord, probably the pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. But angels created, they're created beings existing to serve at the pleasure of heaven and to minister to those chosen of God for salvation. And so throughout the, the ministry of Christ, <clears throat> angels saw him. Now, to be fair, to give you a more complete picture, fallen angels saw him. He cried out, don't send us to the abyss. Don't send us to the bottomless pit. So the demons saw him. Fallen angels. Heavenly angels saw him as well. And Jesus, especially in difficult times, he was seen by angels. For example, in the temptation in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, tells us that angels came and ministered to Christ at the end of his temptation. He strengthened him. Or in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before his crucifixion, a man came, an angel from heaven came. And minister this in Luke chapter 22, verse 43. So angels saw him. Angels saw this mystery of salvation, this mystery of godliness, this person of Jesus in the flesh. So if angels serve Jesus and serve you and me in honor of Jesus, out of love for Christ, shouldn't we also serve each other? Willingly? The fifth benefit I want you to see. Write this down if you would. Jesus is the provision of salvation proclaimed for you and me. Jesus is the provision of salvation proclaimed for you and me. Look back at verse 16. It just simply says he was proclaimed among the nations. He was proclaimed among the ethnic groups. He was proclaimed throughout the world among the nations. And Jesus' name and fame has been preached, and people around the world have received him. Many have not. But many have believed in him and confessed Jesus as Lord. Listen, there's about 7.7 .7 billion people on planet Earth alive today, most of whom do not believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Are you doing anything to pursue them? How about your neighbor? How about the person you come in contact with? The Calusa Baptist Church is a church on mission. We are trying to make the gospel the main thing and focus on Christ. We're wanting to impact others in our community with the message of Jesus as well as reaching out throughout the world. So we are proclaiming the gospel in a variety of ways. We also give to help others who are on the front line 
who are proclaiming the gospel. So it's twofold. We want to proclaim it. We want to give as a church to help others proclaim it who are in areas where we're not. So let me just, you know, we'll see our little offering plates down here. See a couple checks in there now. Praise God. That's good. But listen, when you give and support just the general budget offerings of the church, when you give those offerings, a percentage of every dollar you give just to the general budget goes out to support international missionaries, <coughs> North American missionaries, church planting, other ministries to uh, the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention. But also, in addition to what we do through the Southern Baptist Convention, I know some of y'all aren't Southern Baptists, it's fine. You'd be glad to know this too. That in addition to that, your regular giving also helps to support seven different missions and ministries locally as well as internationally. Ministries that are not funded by the Southern Baptist Convention. And we're just, we're, we're going straight to these people and, and ministries and missions and helping people out. So just your general budget giving goes out all over the world for the sake of the gospel advancement. We're privileged to have one of our supported missionary families with us today at Kroll's. I'm going to invite them to come up for just a moment. We want to chat with them. Uh, these are uh, wonderful folks. If you have not met Jesse and Krista, you need to. Let's get a couple of microphones here and turn them on. We've got a blue one. We'll give a blue one to you. Very manly. Oh, nice green one for you, Krista. Let me tell you a little bit about them and then we're going to talk for a second. But Kristen Connor was raised in LaBelle, so she's a hometown girl. And Jesse moved to LaBelle from Wisconsin. In 2002, to marry Krista. Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> They've done short term missions in Thailand, Argentina, Costa Rica, and Mexico, as well as long term missions in Mongolia and Vietnam. Their latest place of service was Thailand, where they studied the Thai language for a year full time and then did three years of student ministry with Thai and tribal college students. And while there, they also partnered with three Thai churches working together to mentor in evangelism, discipleship, and Bible teaching. Jesse, Jesse and Kristen have two children, Trinia, age 13, and Joya, age 10. Kristen is a trained speech pathologist working in Henry and Glade's school districts. Jesse was a youth pastor in Bell for five years before serving as worship leader and studying for his Master of Divinity with Asbury Theological Seminary. So that's a little bit of a introduction to there's two fine folks you see on stage that we ask for on a monthly basis. Okay? So I just wanted to kind of pick your mind just, just for a moment here this morning so the church can kind of get a picture of who we are and what God's called you to do. And so if you could just share with us a highlight or two from your overseas missionary experience, that would be great. So in 2000, in the year 2000, uh, my teammate and I had the privilege of going to serve in Myanmar and Mongolia, and we had a picture of that for you here. And one highlight for me was just while there, just seeing the hunger for God and for Christ that exists in places. And so my teammate and I, we would lead an evangelistic Bible study in this town, and we would, we would start getting knocks at the door, sometimes up to an hour beforehand. And sometimes it would be friends of ours who were coming for Bible study. Sometimes it would be perfect strangers that we had never met before. We were thinking to ourselves, how do these people even hear about or find our apartment? And so we, a lot of times we'd have 15 to 20 folks sitting around our little room. Little, little and just seeing the hunger for God and, and getting to us and leaders, we didn't see anything uh, amazing, amazing happen while we were there, but then in a few years, I learned that, that the little church that was there, the little church in the province had multiplied to 20 different house churches. So we just praise God for getting to see that. And um, in the next slide you see, we got to go to Thailand. Uh, we spent six years here. We studied the language and we served. And we got to invest and share the gospel with lots of people. And again, we, 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 would, we were praying for just amazing, amazing things and didn't see as many people come to Christ as we had hoped. We did get to share the gospel with a lot of folks, and we got to train leaders just like in Mongolia. And so we're, we're beginning to see glimpses of the people that we train just really multiplying their life, just like Jesus changed the world with 12 people. And so we're just trusting God to continue for him to do something similar that he did in Mongolia and Thailand. No? <laughs> All right. 
So what do you feel the Lord is calling you to do in your future missionary work? Okay, as we were praying about what God would have us do next, we started praying for uh, university students and international students, and God led us on a journey to look at four different universities in the Midwest. And we looked in that area because we work with Southeast Asians, and we were floored at how many students were international students were studying in the United States. So if you could put the next one up. Um, one of the campuses we looked at was University of Wisconsin in Madison. And there, there are 7,000 international students and it's third in the nation for Thai grad students. We were amazed there are one million international students that come study in the States every year. If you could do the next one. But sadly, over 800,000 of these students, they never get invited into an American's home. And over 8,000 of these students, 800,000 of these students never get invited into a church. And so we looked at this and we were like, these students are coming from communist China. They're coming from Muslim nations. They're coming from Hindu, Buddhist nations. This is such a strategic opportunity. So as we were praying, God just led us to, to look into this, and he led us to go to University of Wisconsin. So the next slide. And what we'll be doing there is um, we're there to build relationships with internationals and Thai students. We speak the Thai language. We know their culture. And so it's a natural bridge. And to share the gospel with them and to mentor them, disciple them in the faith, to connect them with churches here and connect them with Christians in their own country and to also uh, build fellowship groups, discipleship groups, so that we can just mentor them in the faith. And then our hope is to send them back to their countries so they can then reach their countries for Christ. So what needs to happen for you guys to be able to pursue this work that you just described? Yeah. Yeah. So next slide, please. Um, so, so basically, we we're not doing a short-term mission trip. We're we're moving there, and we'll be doing this long term. We're not sure how long we'll have there, but uh, just like we we have partnerships with Thai churches in Thailand, we're we're looking for long-term partnerships. So, so we are super thankful for Calusa Baptist and your partnership with several individuals in the church. And uh, so right now we're about fifty percent of our pledge. So. Right now, our, our big need is to really just be able to meet with folks individually and to be able to just share what a little bit more about what uh, God has called us to and get to know people. And then to ask folks to pray and say, you know, is God calling you to pray to be part of this class? Is God calling you to pledge? Um, we, we do not pressure people. Um, we do not pressure people for, for funds or anything like that. But we want to be able to just meet with folks, get to know people, and just say, here's how you can get involved, and would you pray with us about it if God is calling? So if anyone would like to meet with us, we would love to get to know you better. Um, and so we have a sign up on, uh, we have a little clipboard out there if you want to uh, get together with us at some point. We'd love to just be able to share more about it. So that's great. Okay, well, how can we pray for you next? Okay, I wrote the name. Okay. <laughs> All right, y'all listen. Say, <laughs> pray for me.
opportunity for gospel to advance more, that you have provided for them. We know that with a call comes the provision to accomplish what you call them to do. And so we pray that you would give to them the appointments with folks that are necessary, the funds that are necessary to make this transition. We would ask that the timing of that would be for the fall semester. And they're, they're hungry to get after the work. Lord, we pray also for their children. Or it's difficult to move, it's difficult to go somewhere for uh, the sake of the gospel that is uh, not what you're used to and is away from family. And so we pray for their encouragement and transition. We do pray, Lord, that you provide housing very close to the campus, so close that it's, it's just like it's a ministry center that you design for maximum effectiveness. You know, a lot of internationals aren't going to have a vehicle to get somewhere. So give them, give them a really close proximity. Lord, we pray for open doors of opportunity in particular lives, people that you are chasing down, that you're you are trying to say that you're working to convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment and, and the gospel. You're wanting them to hear of Jesus and find life in him. And so we pray, the Father, that you would make their ministry successful. Give them um, success in the mission that you've called them to. And may we be faithful to pray for them and support them. In Jesus' name, amen. Give them a hand.